Hello, welcome to this video. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at a comparison between God's character and eternal punishment. And I'm giving you scriptures for to show you what God is exactly like. And we're going to compare that with eternal punishment and see how it stacks up. And the first one I'm going to give you is God's love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God's love was great enough that he would sacrifice his own Son to save us. This is the kind of love that we know God has. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not exalt itself, is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly, does not seek her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they shall fail, whether there are tongues, they shall cease, whether there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now this tells me that love never fails, and God is love. First John 4, 8 he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verse 16, And we have known and have believed the love that God has in us. God is love, and he who dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Well, if love never fails, love endures all things. Don't you think it looks like God has failed if everlasting punishment is where people are going to? He wants people to love him. He wants people to be with him. He wants to love them. That's what God's bottom line is. That's why he set all this thing up in the beginning. He wants people to love him. And as love never fails, that's what he will eventually get. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Love your enemies? He's telling us to love our enemies. Does he love his enemies? Who are his enemies? All the wicked people, all the people who serve the devil, the devil himself and all the evil angels, they're his enemies. Does he love them? If you believe in everlasting punishment, my friend, you'll have to explain to me how God is love and how that agrees with everlasting punishment because it's beyond me. The next one I want to go to is God's will. What is God's will? Start with Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So this scripture tells us, God works everything according to the counsel of his will. So if we understand what his will is, we can know exactly what he's going to do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
So God's will is for all men to be saved. Praise his name. We understand what God's will is. Jesus himself gave himself a ransom for all. A ransom for everybody. Not only you and me, but also all the wicked people out there in the world. And there's plenty of those. But when Jesus died on that cross, he paid for all men's sins to be forgiven. Not just ours. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some consider slowness, but is very patient toward us, not willing for any to be lost, but for all to go on to repentance. Well, if God's will is for all men to be saved, and yet we know some are going into the lake of fire, do you think God cannot save them just because they're wicked people? He cannot do it. Look at Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of Yahweh. As the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he will. So God can turn the heart of any person towards himself. When he turned his heart toward me, I became a Christian. Jesus said to his disciples, didn't he? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So if God can do that, ask yourself the question, why is he not doing it for everybody? Let's examine another part of God's character, which is God's forgiveness. Matthew 6.14 For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, nor will your Father forgive your trespasses. So God is saying here, we have to forgive everybody. If we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. Well, if he's expecting us to forgive, do you think he's not going to forgive? Eventually? Matthew 18.21 Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times? Jesus says to him, I do not say to you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I don't think Jesus is putting a number on it here. I think he's just saying so many times you just got to keep forgiving. That's what it means. He went on to tell a parable about a servant who owed his Lord a lot of money. And he didn't have what, anything to pay. So the Lord basically forgave him. Then he went out and he tried to demand payment from his fellow servant who owed him a little bit. And when the Lord found out about it, instead of forgiving him, he now put all his debt back on him until he should pay every bit. There's a case here. God is looking to us. We have to forgive if he forgives. Mark 11, verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against any, that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now, here's an interesting point. God expects us, mere human beings, to forgive everybody their sins against us. Is he going to do it himself? Or is he just telling us to do it and he becomes one of these people who say, do what I say, not what I do? I don't think God's a hypocrite. I think he'll do exactly what he says. Eventually, he will forgive all. And if you keep watching, I'll show you how he's going to do it. Luke 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
and they parted his clothing and cast lots. This is Jesus on the cross, and as he was dying, he asked for the forgiveness of the people who were killing him. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on the Lord and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now then, that's a man who when he died, he prayed for God to forgive them, the people who were killing him. This is what God expects us to do. And if God is not a hypocrite, then he's got to forgive people. And I believe one day he will. Look at another aspect of God's character now, which is God's pleasure. What is it that pleases God? So let's examine this. Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Well, God has stated quite plainly, He will do all His pleasure. So whatever His pleasure is, we can find that out. We'll know exactly what He's going to do. Ezekiel 18.31 Cast away from you all your transgressions by which you have transgressed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit for why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him who dies, says the Lord Yahweh. So turn yourselves and live. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord Yahweh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked will turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Well, look at that. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's what he says. What about the lake of fire? That's the second death. That's not going to give him any pleasure whatsoever. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So as long as that anybody in the lake of fire is not giving God any pleasure, is it? And God has stated quite categorically, he will do all his pleasure. So sooner or later, the lake of fire is going to have to finish. Luke twelve thirty two. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, there we go. It's God's pleasure to give us the kingdom. And he has no pleasure in the lake of fire. So, eventually, we'll all get there. Ephesians 1, 5 having predestined us to the adoption of children through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So according to the good pleasure of his will, God has predestined us with Jesus Christ. He's predestined us to be saved. That's what he's saying here. I'm going to have to answer this scripture a little bit deeper. But I think God will not be able to do his will. He won't be able to do all his pleasure without destroying death. And there is a scripture which talks about that, but I'll go into that in another video. Go back now to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, and we'll read several verses. Even as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without fault before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he favored us in the beloved. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of the trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which abounded toward us in all wisdom and understanding, by making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself for the stewardship of the fullness of times, to bring all things together in Christ, both those in heaven and those on the earth in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now there again, God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. And we've already seen what that means. All men to be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. It's also worth going back and reading again in verse 10. For the stewardship of the fullness of times to bring all things together in Christ, both those in heaven and those on the earth in him. This was one of the first scriptures I ever read when I got this idea of the lake of fire not being eternal punishment. You think he's going to save angels? Try and read it again. Uh, But I'm planning to do a separate video on this, so I'm not going to go into it here. This is section number five. I'm going to look at God's mercy. Start off with Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Wow, look at that. God won't cast off forever. But the lake of fire, if that's eternal punishment, he's done exactly what he says he won't do. But though he causes grief, yet he will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Well, that says it all, doesn't it? He'll have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Praise his name. Look at Micah 7.18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Wow. God delights in mercy and therefore he will not retain his anger for ever. But if the lake of fire is eternal punishment, he's retaining his anger forever, isn't he? And he's not getting any delight out of it. Psalm 106, 1. Praise Yahweh, O give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Well, when you read this verse, you've got to ask yourself the question. How is the lake of fire, mercy enduring forever? How is that mercy? Does that match up with God's character? Psalm 118, verse 1. I'll give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now who fear Yahweh say that his mercy endures forever. Psalm 136 verse 1. O give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. Well, every verse in between verse 1 and verse 26 in that psalm says his mercy endures forever. So how you can line that up with the eternal punishment in the lake of fire is completely beyond me. God has shown numerous times in the word that he has mercy on people. For no other reason than he he wants to have mercy on people. As we read earlier, he delights in mercy. Uh, Work your way through the book of Judges and see how many times they went off into idolatry. And when they turned round and called on God, God came and set them free. And he helped them 
every time. Eventually, when he sees they've suffered enough, they've paid for their sin, he lets them off. Look at some examples in the New Testament. The lame man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. 38 years lying on a bed. Didn't believe in Jesus, didn't even recognize him. But God led Jesus there to set him free and heal him. He suffered enough, 38 years as a cripple. Not a joke. What about the blind man in John chapter 9? Doesn't say he had faith for healing. We don't know how long he had been blind, except that we know he was blind from birth. So he'd never even seen the light of day. And God had mercy on him and set him free. What about the lame man at the temple gate in Acts chapter 3? He was lame from his mother's womb, and he was over 40 years old. He didn't ask for healing. He wanted money. He wanted some alms. But God led Peter there to set him free and heal him. He suffered enough. God had mercy on him. In Acts chapter 14, verse 6, we see another one. A man at Lystra, lame in his feet from his mother's womb. God set him free, had mercy on him. He gave him the faith to believe, and he set him free. God's mercy is astounding. And I believe one day he's going to have mercy on them all. This is what he's going to do. He's going to get what he wants. So let's go on to another attribute of God's character now which is how God deals with people. And it can start off with Isaiah 48, verse 10. Behold, I have refined you, but not with silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Now, this is not a literal furnace, brethren. This is a spiritual furnace. It is like a refiner's fire. Go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to Yahweh an offering in righteousness. Now, look at that. God's going to sit there like a refiner of gold and silver. I'm not a refiner, but my understanding is that the way they do it is they put it into a furnace. If they want to purify gold, they put it in a furnace and burn it. And it slowly burns out all the impurities. And if they take it out and they check it and it's not pure, they put it back in until it is pure. And this is what God is doing with us in a spiritual sense. He's refining us. We're going through fiery trials. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the proving of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, but being proved through fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This fire is the fire of persecution and people being against us and all this kind of thing and all the trials that we go through in this life where we're expected to stand by faith. And it's much more precious to go through one of those trials than gold because if you go through one of those and you get through it your faith is increased greatly go to first peter chapter 4 now verse 12 beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you which is happening to you for a test as if a strange thing is happening to you this refining of people is what's happening to us and it's going to be carried on until we come to uh, the image of Jesus, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. 
This is what God is trying to do. He's trying to get all the impurities out of us. And of course, if we cooperate with him and go his way, it'll be done much quicker. I will admit it's a painful process, but there's no other way of doing it. So let's go and have a look now at another element of God's character, which is his justice and his righteousness. Matthew sixteen twenty seven, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Romans 2, 6, Who will render to every man according to his works. Well, now we can see what God's justice is like, what his righteousness is like. He gives to people according to their works. Do you think wicked people ought to be punished? Yes. Do you think they ought to get a fair judgment? Do you think they ought to be punished according to what they do? Or do you think they ought to be punished eternally for doing a few things wrong? Well, this scripture tells you plain. God punishes people according to their works. And when they've suffered enough, he'll, he'll let them off. Second Corinthians 11.15 Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 Alexander the coppersmith showed me much evil. May the Lord reward him according to his works. Well, let me ask you this question. What about the lake of fire? Are they going in there to suffer for their works? Are they going to be judged according to what they've done? And the ones who have been doing lots of wickedness down here on this earth, are they going to suffer more than the others? Go to Revelation 20, verse 12, and we'll find out. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and everyone was judged according to their works. Well, that tells you it all. When people go into the lake of fire, they're going to be judged according to their works. So if they've done a lot of evil, they'll get a lot of punishment. And if they've done a little bit of evil, they'll get a little bit of punishment. But they're going to be rewarded according to their works. Why? Because God is just and God is righteous. Look at the last section of this now. This is number eight. God's predestination. Go back to Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Furthermore, whom he predestined, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So he tells you twice in this verse we've been predestined. Predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus and spend our life and eternity with him. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 again. Having predestined us to the adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 10. For in the stewardship of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, when you look at predestination, you've got to ask yourself the question, has God predestined some to heaven and some to hell? 
There are people who teach it. But God is no respecter of persons. So how could he possibly do that? If he has predestined any to heaven, he's going to have to predestine all. Look at the scriptures. Acts 10 verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. Ephesians 6 9. And you masters do the same things to them, without threatening, knowing that your Lord also is in heaven, and there is no respect of persons with him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 25. But he who does wrong shall receive for what he did wrong, and there is no respect of persons. So what does it mean to respect persons? Whether a person is black or white, rich, poor, man, woman, tall, short, whatever they are physically, whatever they are in this world, God has no respect for that. But what he does respect, God is a respecter of your faith. God is a respecter of the inner man. That's what God is looking for. James chapter 2 verse 9. But if you respect persons, you work sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. So if God respected persons, he'd be a sinner himself, wouldn't he? First Peter 1.17 And if you call on the Father, who is out respect of persons, judges, according to everyone's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Well, that's coming to the end now. I just want to give you a summary of what we've gone through. The first one we looked at was God's love. The second one was God's will, and that was for all men to be saved. The third one was God's forgiveness. And we saw that God has delight in forgiving people. The fourth one was God's pleasure, God's good pleasure. The fifth one was God's mercy. The sixth one was the fact that he's a refiner, like he's refining things in a fire. And the seventh one was God's justice or righteousness. The last one was God's predestination. Every one of these things points to the fact that sooner or later, when God's judgment is passed upon people, those who are cast into the lake of fire will stay there until they have been rewarded according to their works. So, some will be in there a lot longer than others. Jesus said about Judas Iscariot, it was better for that man he'd never been born. Punishment in the lake of fire is graded. And eventually, of course, I'm believing that God will let them all out when they've suffered enough. God's mercy is so great. So I hope you've got something out of this video. And if you did, please give God all the glory. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you in Jesus' name. I'm planning to do another one and show you where all this is prophesied. So please don't miss it. Click center to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click top right to see more videos. Go also to our website and see some great Bible studies, Hebrew and Greek word studies, and lots more. And God bless you.